Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Tom Woods Show, episode 2406. You know, now that I have video, it's much harder for me to do the episodes the way I used to. I, I used to be able to, for example, I'd come back from the gym, I'd take a shower, my hair's still wet, can't notice because there's audio only. Now I just get out of the shower and it's obvious to everybody, but doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Dominic Frisbee is here to cover over all my sins uh, in the podcasting world. Dom is, as I keep describing him, I, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way at all, he's a jack of all trades, but most jacks of all trades, they do a lot of things, but they're terrible at all of them. But Dom is good at everything he does. That's the difference. I mean, he's a voiceover guy. He's a comedian. He's a lecturer. He's a financial commentator. Uh, he's got his own newsletter. Um, he's a playwright. He's, I mean, I, I'm sure I left a couple things out. I, I, that's by omi- uh, um, in, in, uh, inadvertent omission. I will say he's also an author. Um, I think the book of yours I read was, oh gosh, what's the one on taxation? Daylight robbery. The, Daylight the, st- yeah, <laughs> staring right, right the, See, I'm not used to video. It's staring me right in the face. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We actually bought it at a London bookstore. Um, and I think my wife might have had you sign it or something. But but yeah, we saw it in the store. We thought, we're going to buy Dom's book right here. So indeed we did. So anyway, I want to talk to you because you have a new video out, um, a, 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 a comical kind of video about CBDCs and let's say the WEF and stuff like that. So we do want to talk about that. I also want to talk about gold and some other things. But but let's let's start with this CBDC thing, central bank digital currencies. There's a lot of ch- chatter about this, and there's a lot of concern among some people that these things could turn out to be instruments of control. Now, obviously, that is not how central banks are are billing them, are are pitching them to us. Uh, they presumably think they meet some need. So what alleged need is it that a quote-unquote central bank digital currency would meet, according to them? Well, I don't really know the answer to that, Tom, because nobody's voted for them. Nobody seems to want them. I've not heard anyone speak up or in favor of them, and yet they seem to be inevitable. And I think what's happened is that central banks around the world have looked at Bitcoin, and they've just been really impressed by it. And they've sort of wanted to copy it. And they've sort of taken it upon themselves to invent their own technology based around blockchain. I do also think that that money is technology. And so as technology has evolved, what we use as money has evolved. And effectively, almost all money is just a promise between executed between parties that trust each other. So, for example, if you go into a shop and you pay with your credit card, your the credit card reader is talking to your bank, and then your bank's talking to the credit card reader, which is talking to the credit to the bank of the person in the shop, and so on. And it's all just a series of promises between parties that trust each other. And so, and if you think of the very first money that was sent across the Atlantic, it was it's called cable, the pound to the dollar um, exchange rate. It was only made possible when the cable was laid underneath the Atlantic. And previously, you'd have to send your money by boat, and it took two weeks. And now suddenly we've got this cable, and the great expression at the time, the advertising slogan, was two weeks to two minutes. And within a few days of this technology being up and running, two parties that trusted each other, a bank in England and a bank in the United States, agreed the first exchange rate between the pound and the dollar. And that's why it's called cable. But basically, that transatlantic cable transformed how, transformed how we communicate with each other, and so it transformed money. And the same thing, I think it's something like, I can't remember the number, but I think it's 10,000 times more transactions happen every minute than messages. That would be emails and text messages and so on. But That has only been made possible by the internet and modern communication and so on. So technology evolves what money is. And I just think blockchain and Bitcoin and all the rest of it is the latest evolution. And that's why central banks have taken it upon themselves to invent their own. And even though nobody wants them, I think they're inevitable. It's interesting because this is a case where 
people who are against them are very vocal and they have a lot of concerns about them. But as but with most things where we're vocal, we have a lot of concerns. There's another side to the argument that is there to allay our concerns or say that we're all crazy or to put forth the merits of whatever the thing is. But as you say, in this case, it's almost like there is no other side other than the employees of the central banks. There is no other side. Like I don't hear progressives sitting around saying, I can't wait for CBDCs. I mean, maybe they might like them if they find out what they're all about, but they don't talk about them. It's like it's not even on their radar. So it's like we're arguing into the wind really right now because we have really no resistance. But I have heard, though, people say, you know, it's hard to know how what to conclude from this because on the one hand, you hear people, probably the architects of the CBDCs, saying that you conspiracy people, you always think everything is going to put be put to some sinister purpose. And reali- really, this is just a convenience for everybody. But on the other hand, you can find the odd clip from a World Economic Forum meeting where somebody will accidentally let slip that it will indeed let us track your purchases and keep an eye on you. So what do you think is the likely outcome with them? I think what will happen is they'll get introduced and there'll be all sorts of assurances that the technological possibilities of surveillance and so on won't be employed. And then as soon as we get some kind of crisis, they'll start employing them and then they'll be normalized. Um, you know, I'm a libertarian like you. I'm a gold bug. I'm a Bitcoin bug. I think money should just be money and nothing else. But the reality is, is that money, probably since the time of Alexander the Great, you know, when coins were first put on, when heads were first put on coins, money has always been a political tool. Whether it's a tool of propaganda or in the case of debasing money so that you can spend more of it, a, a, a literally a tool of, of spending. and you know, with fiat money, that's got even worse. But with CBDCs, what worries me is, like, if you look at Bitcoin and the immutable ledger that is the blockchain, even though the transactions are anonymous, every transaction for even just one Satoshi, an nth of a penny, is recorded there and can be analyzed going back forever. Now, with CBDCs, it means that Every transaction you ever make can be monitored. It means that um, a central bank can reach into your wallet if it wants and extract money for fines, unpaid taxes, anything it deems. And sometimes, you know, a large corporation takes money via direct debit against your will. And you know the nightmare you have getting that money back. But when it's the government and you're dealing with the IRS or the Inland Revenue or whoever it is, it's going to be even worse. And... There'll be things like, did you get the vaccine? Okay, so we'll reward you with some money. Or did you not Did you not get the vaccine? Have you been saying bad things about us on social media? Well, we're going to fine you. And it just means money will become even more of a political tool. It's a whole new evolution in how money can be exploited for political ends. And so I, I just wish money was apolitical. The reality is that it isn't, and it's going to get worse. Well, uh, here's the part that I don't quite follow. Money only becomes money, or, or like Mises would describe money as the, the, the commonly used medium of exchange. So you can be a medium of exchange, uh, like you, I'm, you know, there could be people who use, still use seashells or something, but since it's not the generally accepted medium of exchange, Mises wouldn't classify that as money. Mm-hmm. So if CBDCs, are used by 12 nerds, but the general public isn't interested in using them, then they never really take off as money. So it, it, isn't there a sense in which this can't work without our consent, or is there some way they can coerce us into use? I hadn't thought of that. And there's definitely a way they can coerce us. I mean, you see how we're going cashless. Yeah, and a trend that say- needs to be fought at every turn. In fact, can we stop there? What's what, what's the problem with, with going cashless? They'll say it's convenience. You can just walk around and make all your purchases on a card. How convenient. Um, well, just Can you tell people what's wrong with that? Well, cash empowers its users. Because if I'm, let's say I'm with you and I just give you money, that transaction only involves you and me. 
So it can be a pri- it's very useful for private transactions, for small transactions, for quick transactions. Like a for tip, immediate trans- a tip. A guy takes my my luggage up up to the room. I, I don't want to get out a, a device and figure out Busking. how much I'm going to pay him, and but I want to just hand him a bill. Sure, buskers. Think of buskers and beggars. N- now buskers and beggars are carrying credit card readers, or at least they are in London. <laughs> it's 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 bizarre, and but the the problem with um, a cashless society is that anyone who's outside of the system, uh, who anyone who is for whatever reason is financially excluded, is effectively excluded from the economy. And, you know, the, one of the biggest economic problems in the world is the problem of the unbanked. I still think there's 2 billion people around the world who are unbanked. And, you know, people wonder, for example, why did the mobile phone take off in the third world in the way that the landline never did? And the reason is, you know, telecoms companies would have laid landlines in the Arctic if they thought there was money to be made out of it. But to have a landline, you need credit, you need a bank account. Whereas to get a mobile phone, you don't. You only need cash. And so mobile phones have been able to take off um, and, and, and smartphones in the third world in a way that, that the landline never could. And the same applies to money. And so one big problem with going cashless is that it is exclusive. But I will say this. In the marketplace, convenience usually wins. And one of the reasons, like, cashlessness suits governments, but I don't believe they've actually imposed it. I think it's happened because credit card readers and and fintech is just so good and so advanced. I think that's the main reason we've gone cashless. And there's a few purists that fight it, and I still try to use cash where I can. But a lot of the time, it's just easier... I don't have to carry money around with me if I don't want to. I can just carry my phone and I can just go block and it's done. Uh, just a general observation. In most things, America is ahead of the rest of the world, particularly technologically. But fintech-wise, the States is behind Europe. Um, you still use checks. You use cash much more than we do in Europe. There are certain, some countries in Europe, in Scandinavia, where they're... they're Effectively, they're already cashless. And so for some reason, fintech, we're slightly ahead of you. And so if you want to know what's coming your way, you can just just look across the pond. And yeah. I, I just think cashlessness is inevitable. And then the next stage from there is, is programmable money. That's the danger with CBDCs. It's programmable money, where they can use money to incentivize you to do certain things. That's where it gets really Orwellian. Well, I, was, I interrupted you uh, when you were talking about ways they might coerce us into using it. Or maybe they might even just give us a, a, a slight advantage if we use it, which will be enough for a lot of people. Social credit rating. It's, uh, you know, they use it in China already, so I believe. And, you know, we have a thing called the Ministry of Nudges, and I bet you have something similar in America. It's not, it, a Ministry of Nudges is an unofficial name, but it's where they have behavioral psychologists who work with government ministers in order to effect policy. So for example, they found if you send someone a photograph of your car while you're committing some kind of traffic violation, it's much more likely way of getting you to pay quickly for the traffic violation than if they just send you a fine. So there's all these little ways that behavioral psychology is used as a tool of government. And for sure, when when CBDCs come along and programmable money, the behavioral psychologists are going to have a field day. What's well? Okay, let, let's actually let's switch gears because I'm afraid I'm going to forget. Otherwise, you you mentioned the term programmable money, yeah, and that happens to be the name of a video you just made. So, I'll, obviously, I'll link to that in the description. And our show notes page is tomwoods.com/slash twenty four oh six. It'll also be there. What's the premise behind this this video? It's just a few minutes. Yeah, it's a it's a. I, I write comic songs, as you know, and and your listeners may not know that, but. One of my sidelines is, is writing comic songs. And so we made this sideline, this, this video, this musical video, um, Programmable Money, and I shaved all my hair off to make myself look like Klaus Schwab of the WEF. <laughs> and uh, it's got me there stroking a white cat. Well, and the and voice got, a bit, the voice also. Yeah, yeah, I did a sort of stupid Swiss accent like he has, called Swiss Action, and it's done in the style of craft work. Um, an old band from the 80s and uh, 90s, if uh, you remember Very them. familiar. 
And it's actually very witty because even though I say this myself, the music goes, the chords we play are C, B, D, C. So there's a sort of musical pun in there. Most people wouldn't notice that. but And um, it's just a song, a comic song about what's going to happen with um, uh, 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 CBDCs. And we got um, these people to dress up as robots and do all these robotic dances. And, and the dancers were absolutely brilliant. It's a hell of a production, even though I say so myself. Yeah, it's fantastic. People should watch it. Uh, people should definitely watch it. It's, it's, it's outstanding. But at the end of it, you say something like, Bitcoin fixes this. Now, that's, a, that's become a common refrain in Bitcoin circles. Bitcoin fixes this. But let me push back against that a little bit. I'm, I'm pro-Bitcoin. I've never been hostile. I have my questions, but I'm, I'm not hostile. I'm a friend. But I'm, I'm um, and I, I would say I don't take sides in some of the internal Bitcoin arguments because I'm not informed enough to have an opinion. And unlike most people who feel like they read half an article and they're the world's foremost expert and they're entitled to yammer on endlessly, I know my limits, okay? I know where I'm not qualified to speak. But I will say, that when Bitcoin was first described to me a little over 10 years ago uh, by a couple of people who are real experts on the subject, names people would know, it was described to me as something that would actually challenge the U.S. dollar, that this would be an alternative. We could have a, a, a money that couldn't be manipulated and that wasn't government run even indirectly. And that seemed really attractive to me. And then all of a sudden, like a bait and switch, it became, yeah, you know what? Turns out that's really hard. You know, there are an awful lot of transactions to process. So instead, let's think of Bitcoin as a nice alternative store of wealth. But the thing is, I already have a store of wealth, you know, like I have gold. So what happened to the, I could go into the store and buy things with Bitcoin. I, it's like, no one cares about that all of a sudden. And if you bring that up, it's like, you know, it's like you let out a stink bomb at a cocktail party. Okay. Well, let me. Just defend Bitcoin there for Please, a moment. Please, I, wa I want to hear the defense. Okay, so the, the first thing you raised there is the, the micropayments and the, and the mass adoption issue. That has largely been solved by the Lightning Network. It allows for payments for pennies and ends of a penny, and, and it allows for a scalability that didn't previously exist. So the technology that was resisting that has been solved. The second thing is, Bitcoin was intended to be money for the internet. It was never money for the real world. So you're never going to really use it except as a gimmicky thing to go in and buy a cup of coffee or something like that. You can do it, and it's quite easy to set yourself up. The other problem is with, you know, Gresham's Law, good money drives out bad and all that. If you've got the, the choice of paying for a cup of coffee with your gold or with your US dollar, you're going to use your US dollar because your gold is a better savings vehicle than the US dollar. So I think a lot of that applies to Bitcoin as well. It's, a, it's an online savings vehicle. So people, where they can, prefer to use um, fiat because it loses its value quicker. But even so, the technology is there for Bitcoin to be used for mass small transactions. Now, let me put an idea into your head, Tom. And the issue here is scalability. The US dollar is the global reserve currency and it's used for international transactions and commodity markets are traded in US dollars and yada yada. But the US dollar is still limited by America, by its borders. It's quite hard to get a US dollar account if you're not an American, for example. Um, so that limits the scalability of the US dollar. But Bitcoin, as money for the internet, is borderless. So there's no limit of national borders. The only limit on how much Bitcoin can expand is the internet. And there's a possibility, I'm not saying it will happen, but it's likely that Bitcoin becomes the default currency of the internet. And so the standard on which things like, you know, air miles, credit card points, supermarket points, international currencies. Let's say I wanted to send you some money, Tom, just, you know, tip you for your show or something. The, the easiest way for me to do that is with the Lightning Network over Bitcoin. It, and we talk about how convenience wins, but for cross-border payments, it is actually, the, across the internet, particularly when the payments are small, it is actually more effective than PayPal or something like that. So 
that's where the future of Bitcoin is, if you ask me. And, and you need to think in terms of the scalability of it. Obviously, I don't think, um, you know, oil is going to be traded in Bitcoin. But, you know, baby steps. In 20 or 30 years, you know, maybe Saudi Arabia does want uh, Bitcoin for its oil rather than US dollars. Maybe, you know, Iran can sell its oil in, uh, Iran is excluded from the financial system, can't use US dollars. If, you, if I offered Iran a load of Bitcoins for its um, oil, I'm sure somebody there would go, actually, do you know what, I'll take that. Everybody, a quick message on behalf of our sponsor, Blinkist. If you've got a big stack of books by your bedside and you find that you're buying two books for every one you finish, well, then you're pretty much like every listener of The Tom Woods Show, including, dear listener, your host here. I know what it's like. You can't stop yourself. You're going to be buying books till the day you drop dead. You can't stop it. But how do you get all the information into your brain? And the answer is Blinkist can help you do so. Blinkist has taken thousands and thousands of nonfiction titles across 27 different categories and condensed them down into 15-minute blinks, as they call them, which you can either read or listen to and get all the key takeaways from the book with none of the fluff, just the essential things you need to know. So if you've got a 30-minute commute, back and forth, that's an hour. And that means four books, in effect, can be consumed in that time with Blinkist. That's how I've used it, and that's how I strongly recommend my readers use it. And incidentally, you will find libertarian classics at Blinkist, including by Murray Rothbard and Milton Friedman, and even a title, from Old Woods here. And these categories go well beyond politics. Don't spend all your time reading about politics. Read about history or economics or health and meditation or career and business or relationship and family or science and technology or productivity or philosophy, religion, all kinds of topics over there waiting for you at Blinkist to help you become a more informed person and help you get all that information you crave stuffed into that brain of yours. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Well, let me ask this. When did you, let's say, get into Bitcoin? When did you, did you ever have a skeptical period or yeah. you heard about it and you said, I'm going to this is the future. reach behind me and I'm going to pull my chair and you'll see a thing there. Uh, that's a book called Bitcoin, the Future of Money, which I wrote back in 2014. And, uh, you know, I was an early adopter, but I was, a, I was very unlucky because I, I had my Bitcoins and I got hacked. So I'm not Mr. Bitcoin gazillionaire like I should be, given how early I found out about it. Um, and I have my doubts all the time. You know, I'm a big believer in gold, and I really bought into the gold narrative. And then in that period, 20, from 2012, say, to about 2016, and I kept hearing these people going, the US dollar is going to collapse, gold, gold, gold. And then you looked at the gold price, and it was just falling, falling, falling. Right. I was like, no, it isn't. Yeah. So I respect the might of the U U.S. dollar. I just think all these things are going to coexist and we're in entering a sort of Hayekian world of multiple currencies. But the beauty, like John Matonis is a, a, a Bitcoin OG, original gangster, he's a good friend of mine, and he says that CBDCs are the on-ramp into Bitcoin, um, which I find quite interesting because it will just normalize the use of digital currencies and then people will realize, well, actually, They'll have a, a dollar wallet on their phone and they'll have a Bitcoin wallet on their phone and they'll have some other all currency and a pound wallet and a euro wallet. And we'll all just have multiple wallets on our phones. Well, I, I, don't, I don't rule that possibility out uh, either. But now that you've mentioned gold, uh, let me ask this. And you also mentioned people who confidently predict the future about it, about it and the dollar. It seems like maybe some people have soured on gold because people who our uh, gold bugs have made wild promises and predictions about it. I mean, I've been hearing gold going to $5,000 for 15 years, and I bet some people have been hearing it even longer than that. 
So what's yeah. what's the matter here? Why are people off on this prediction all the time? Is it partly that they have a vested interest in getting other people to buy gold because they have big gold holdings? I mean, is it really that cynical or are they just really bad at timing things or what's going on? Well, there's a bit of that. There's a bit of, you know, I, I just think it's natural. If, if you buy shares in something, you'll often talk up the company of the thing you've bought shares in. You talk up your investments. That's, you could say that's nefarious and manipulative, but it's also human nature. You talk up what you've invested in. You know, the best salesmen for the product are often the people who've invested in it. So there's a bit of that. I think a lot of it as well, Tom, is, you know, my editor at Money Week once said to me, he went, Dominic, when you rant, you alienate the undecided. You confirm the biases of those who agree with you, but you alienate the undecided. And he mm. always like, argued that I should be more measured. But actually, in the, on the internet, the internet doesn't work like that. It's the more extreme you are and the less measured you are, they're the ones who get the big followings. Yeah, there's you know, no question about it. Whether it's loony left or libertarian maniac, it doesn't matter what your politics or your worldview is. The more extreme you are, the, the bigger your following you get. So what's the point of me, if I want to get my, you know, loads of attention and build up my following, and I predict gold's going to $1,900 and it's eighteen fifty at the moment, <laughs> nobody cares. <laughs> if I go, gold's going to 10000 the US dollar's going to collapse, headline, headline, sensationalist, sensationalist, you get more attention. So I think there's a bit of that going on as well. Yeah, yeah, there definitely is. And, you know, incidentally, I, I do think there is a misconception out there about, you know, yes, you're right, the internet is a crazy place, but, but leaving the internet aside, even if there weren't an internet, you would have people saying, Dom, if only you would be more moderate in the tone of your presentation, you would, you would convert more people. I'm not even convinced of that. Because I Nor think I. what converted me to most of my positions, it wasn't somebody... They're uh, very, very um, in, in a in a very methodical way, laying out step by step what the argument was. It was somebody who was full of righteous passion. That 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 made me think I better pay attention to this because I think there may be something here. And then on my own, I investigated and I realized that guy's right. But if he had just been droning on with with charts and graphs as accurate as they may have been, it wouldn't have penetrated the old noodle here. Absolutely, there's. My editor came up, I saw him at a party the other day, and he came up to me and he said, remember that conversation we had? I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? How about that? Yeah. How about that? Well, you, you know, it's, it, incidentally, I have a friend, I won't embarrass him, although he's a very, very good sport and he might be perfectly willing to admit this at, 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 at this point, but he was writing a book about how because he's a libertarian, and, and he was writing a book about how both sides of the political argument are wrong. And that was going to be his thesis. They're both wrong. And I said, if you're writing that as an intellectual exercise because you derive intellectual pleasure from it, I have no argument with you. But if you're expecting to sell copies of that, forget it. No one wants that. Nobody no. wants to be told, I'm also wrong. They want to be told, I'm right. And those are stupid people. And yeah. I, I'm not, you know, you don't have to always cater to that, but you need to temper your expectations when you have a book that's going to try to say, now, hey, everybody, calm down. Because, you know, I wrote a, one of my books that did the least well um, was called Who Killed the Constitution? And the answer was basically everybody, the left, the right, the courts, the president, the Congress. It was everybody. Nobody wants that. <laughs> it was my mortal right. enemy killed the Constitution. Yeah. John McCain killed the Constitution. Nancy Pelosi killed. Well, whoever it was, it's always got to be somebody. Yeah, but and the same goes with Bitcoin and gold. Bitcoin's going to 50,000... Um, you know, Bitcoin's going to $100,000. Bitcoin's going to a million dollars. Bitcoin's going to zero. Gold's going to zero. It's got no use. It's just jewelry. Gold's going to 10000 Those are the guys who get the following. Doesn't matter which, Yeah. whether they're bullish or bearish, they're the ones who get. And, you know, if you sit there and go, well, I could have a 10% 10, 10 increase next year. <laughs> well, what cares. I like about you, I mean, <laughs> you, you and I have, have, you know, are kind of out there in our opinions, but sometimes your forecasts might not be wildly extreme. That the gold is going to ten thousand or something like that. So, so the way you do it is you try and generate attention through these funny uh, comic songs and your various appearances, and that gets them. And then that once you've got them, then you can tell them gold's probably going up fifty bucks. <laughs> you know that. Then you've got them in your lair, and then you can go yeah. from there. Well, I I think you know my following's not that big, Tom. Maybe I need to get a bit more extremist in my old age and and uh, you know get out there. You know, it, 
1980, the US could have paid off its debt with its gold. And there's a, if the same with situation would happen again, that was the Iranian hostage crisis. Russia just invaded Afghanistan and gold went to 850. And, the, and assuming that America's gold was actually there, and we all know that Fort Knox hasn't been audited in 60 years or something, but assuming America actually had the gold it said it does, it could have settled its debt with its gold. And if a similar ratio were to occur again now, gold would have to be $50,000, $100,000. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so those kind of numbers are possible because it's happened before. So it could happen. For the sake of headlines, gold's going to hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I'll put that as the headline of this episode, and <laughs> we'll see what people think. W eight count. Well, you know what? Let me go back to something you said earlier that convenience tends to win out on the market, because mm -hmm. that reminds me of something Milton Friedman said about gold. Because because his view was, it seems like a market ineff inefficiency. If uh, why would we employ all these resources to mining gold and all the all the steps that go to taking gold and making it into, um, uh, you know, a coin or something, when I can save all those resources, just print, print money. And, and that is the same argument that a lot of people on the other side will make. The, the gold is stupid and backward and barbaric. What, why would we need it? It's just a waste of, waste of resources. Why, but, but I have a feeling you don't think it's a waste of resources. Well, I'm a massive Milton Friedman fan, as I'm sure you are, but he never liked gold. And um, therefore, we can dismiss everything Milton Friedman ever said about anything. The uh, gold was the very first metal that human beings used. If you Google it, the internet says that copper was the first metal that we used, 8,000 years BC or whatever it was. But we were using gold long before the Bronze Age, long before we discovered smelting, long before we started using copper tools, you know, a Stone Age man would encounter bits of gold as he hunted and gathered, and he wore them, same as we do now. And he'd give them out as reward. He'd give them out as presents. He'd give them out as prizes. And he'd use them as a tool of barter. And we were using gold long before any other metal. And here's the amazing thing about gold. It's thought that gold is created when in interstellar collisions, supernovae collisions in outer space. And the current history of how the solar system came to be is that it's the result of one such um, uh, interstellar collision, supernovae collision billions of years ago, and gold was created. And then gradually, all it was in the dust which formed the solar system, and that dust got compressed and the planets were formed. And so did gold find its way into the um, Earth's crust. Now. You cannot destroy gold. It never loses its shine. So that little, that gold coin, I've got a 500-year-old gold coin in my desk here. I'll get it out if I can in the time I've got available, if I can find it in time. And I'll hold it up to camera. I can't, I'm not going to be able to get it out in, in, in time, but I could hold we'll it up to camera it. and it, it would be shining just as it would was 500 years ago. It, or, or uh, sorry, 1,500 years ago. It's a Justinian solidus. It never loses its luster. It never loses its shine. The only way you can destroy gold is nuclear explosions or dissolving it in certain acid. So all the gold that has ever been mined still exists in the world. But not just that. It is older than the Earth itself. Not just older than the Earth, it is older than the solar system. So this little bit of gold that I've got around my neck, you can see it away, shining there away. I can touch that gold, and I'm touching something that is older than the solar system itself, and it's ex exactly as it was before the solar system was formed. So to hold that gold is the closest I will ever come to touching eternity. And I think that's a very profound thought. And at the same time, we, we have this instinct for gold because it's the first metal we used. At the same time, it's totally useless. Gets, it, it's got so little industrial use, a little bit in mobile phones, a little bit in spaceships, a little bit in teeth, whatever. It's minimal. And yet, 
it's the most prized, the most fought about, the most political metal in all history. And the, the historian Bernstein, he said, nothing is as useful and as useless at the same time. And just as gold lasts forever, so does its purchasing power. And this little bit of gold that's around my neck will be here. It will be here shining away exactly as it does now, long after humanity has destroyed itself. Long after the, the world has blown up and been invaded by aliens, that gold will still be here. And I hope that's why gold has a use. It's an analog asset in a digital age, but it will never lose its relevance. Well, having said that, what is the relevance of gold in 2023? Again, some people would think it's part of a bygone era, um, dead and buried and, and good riddance. Uh, but yet it still, even now, plays some role. It does something, given that we see so many, even so many central banks who ordinarily are trying to tell us that we don't need to buy gold and it's stupid and superstitious to do so. They buy it. What do they see in it? Well, you could say that. that like Bernanke said a few years ago to Ron Paul in that famous exchange, the only reason central banks hold gold is tradition. And you could say gold is as irrelevant to money as the horse is to transport. The horse was natural transport for thousands of years. Long came the motor car. We no longer use the horse. You could say the same about gold. And it's all it's ever going to be now is jewelry. And yet, central banks around the world still hold gold. Central banks, all the central banks that make up the Shanghai Gold Corporation, sorry, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is basically most of Asia, have been buying gold at the fastest rate in, since the late 1960s. They're all accumulating vast amounts of gold. They all want to exit the US dollar system. They all need a currency that they can transact with each other in that they can trust each other with. But nobody trusts each other because a lot of those regimes are a bit dodgy. If only there was some um, independent substance that everyone could trust. Um, human beings, you know, have, have been buying gold for, in ETFs. Uh, the, the Indians in the Asians still actually buy physical stuff and give it, give it out to each other at birthdays and weddings and stuff. But even in the West, GLD, people buy ETFs. And they still buy gold for the same reason they've always bought it, as a, as a store of wealth outside the system. So even if it is irrelevant, people are still buying it. And I think that will continue. There will be some that just go, it's irrelevant, and others that still continue to hoard it and buy it and prize it. But it will always be prized, and we will always, always have an instinct for it. And so if China, and by the way, I, I've written about this a lot on my blog and I've done more work on it than anyone, auditing how much gold is in China. And currently America has 8,000 tons, so it says, and China has about 2,000. But if you look at all the gold that China has mined a century, and there are geological records that show it, and then you take into account that China's gold, China's gold mining is more than 50% state-owned. And then you look at all the gold that China's imported, and some of it you can audit what comes through Hong Kong, what comes through Dubai, Switzerland, London is harder, but you can still make reasonable estimates based on gold that gets withdrawn from the Shanghai um, Gold Exchange. And if you put that, those numbers together, China gold imports, China gold production, and what was already in China in, two, in, China in around about 2000, you realize that China has more than 35,000 tons of gold. And let's just say half of that is state-owned. Then you arrive at a figure of 17,000 tons, which is twice what America has. Twice. It, 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 it's gold holdings are way higher than it says it does. Now, there has, if, if do we, China, we know is extraordinarily ambitious. It wants to have the global reserve currency. It's not quite ready for that yet. We must not shine too brightly as its motto. But if China were to declare its actual gold holdings, that would be a huge weapon of financial war on the United States dollar. Now, it's not ready for that yet, but it will do that at some point. 
And when it does, the gold price will go bananas. But at the moment, it's still accumulating. But I promise you, based on my studies, already the Chinese government has twice as much gold as the US. And there's your headline. <laughs> <laughs> there's another one. <laughs> But and, and uh, if you want to Google it, just Google flyingfrisbee.com is my substat. But I've done all the studies there. And if you follow the logic and you follow, follow the spreadsheets, you'll go, crikey, it's just not ready to declare what its holdings actually are. You know, uh, uh, one last thing before I ask about what you've been up to oh, the past. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Tom, could I say one last thing? Yeah, please do. There has never been in all history a global reserve currency that did not start out backed by gold. They all ended up getting debased into oblivion, the pound, um, the dollar, uh, you know, Roman money, Greek money, medieval money, but they all started out backed by gold, global reserve currencies, from Alexander the Great through till the US dollar. If China wants the world to trust the renminbi, the answer lies in making it redeemable for gold. Let's see. I want to ask you about the thing that you've been doing the past few days. So we'll do that in a minute. But sure. The, the, the thing is, uh, okay, I have some gold and I have Bitcoin and I, you know, I, I do the, I go the investment route and all that, but obviously Bitcoin has turned out very well considering how early I got in. So that, that was, that was good. But you're right about, yeah, I mean, B Bitcoin has had its bearish phases. I mean, it's only about, um, uh, you know, what what is it? It's less than half of what it was at its height, considerably less mm -hmm. than half. Um, gold is much stronger than that in terms of its, you know, overall highs and lows historically at the moment. But there are there are bear periods. And so I've kind of come to the conclusion, and I don't know that this is something other people can easily replicate, but I've come to the conclusion, the only thing I can really rely on for sure is myself not hoping the gold price goes up or hoping Bitcoin goes up. It'd be nice if they did. And if they do, I'm positioned well. But instead, I think about different revenue streams I can build up, different products I can create, different offerings I can have, so that you know, if one of those goes down, it doesn't matter, I have 12 others. And to me, that is, and I know there'll be, I'll have investment people saying, Tom, you're out of your mind. You could be making so much money if you would just put it in X, Y, or Z. I get it, but maybe I'm so much of a control freak that because I don't control X, Y, or Z, I don't make any of the decisions, I'm not on the board of directors, entrusting them with my wealth just doesn't come naturally to me. Yeah, I, I get that. Like, I'm the same. I've got my gold, I've got my Bitcoin, I've got my investments. I hope they do well. I'll be a lot happier if they do do well. But at the end of the day, I've got me and I like working and I think I bring a variety of skills that, that hopefully people want to hire and, and yeah, I, I like working and I want to carry on earning money and I want to carry on, I think by working I'm, you know, it's only my little tiny bit of the world, but I think I make my little corner of the world a little bit better and yeah. I bring laughter and, and thought and various other things and, and I, I want to carry on doing that and I don't want to just sit in the corner and count my gold all day. So I think, I, I guess my point is... Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I guess my point is I'll, I've, I've bought it and, I, and I'm glad I have it, but, I'm not, but if it does well, it's a bonus. I'm not relying on it. I'm not going to be in the poorhouse if it turns, turns down. You know, I, I've, I've planned ahead in other ways. Because uh, there's anything that that's out of my control, it just makes me lose my mind, you know, because of my control freak nature. I think in a in a balanced portfolio, if you're still in your earning years, you want to have a bit of real estate, a bit of gold, a bit of Bitcoin, uh, a, maybe some bonds. I don't really know about bonds, but you want to have a bit of bonds. You want to have a bit of exposure to energy bit of exposure to the stock market, bit of exposure to emerging markets, and so on. And that's a sensible, diversified portfolio. And the 
like you have a diversified portfolio to protect what you have, but you concentrate when you want to grow what you have. So, you know, if you look at the richest people in the world, whether it's a sportsman or a, a brilliant scientist or whatever he does, they made their money by being focused on one thing. Once they have their wealth, then they're diversified to, to protect it. And you still have got that drive. So you've got your concentration on your Tom Woods businesses and so on. And that's how you're building your wealth. But at the same time, you've got your little diversified, your bit of gold, your bit of Bitcoin. Presumably you've got some S&P and some real estate and various other things. And that's your diversified, how you protect what Tom Woods has already earned. Tell me about the uh, physical exertion you've undergone the past few days and what it was all about. I was rather surprised. I invited you on the show and the thing you told me you were doing, I didn't even know really was a thing, except in a religious context. Yeah, nor did I really. But if you know your Chaucer, Chaucer was an, an old English poet and he wrote a thing called Canterbury Tales. And it's one of the first sort of stories in English literature. And it was about a group of pilgrims who walk from London to Canterbury. Canterbury Cathedral is the sort of the capital of the Church of England. And it was the, it was the first places that the Roman settlers came to way back when. And it's the first place that Christianity came to when it came to England. And it takes about six or seven days. And just last Thursday or Friday, I wasn't doing anything. I didn't have any thing to do. So I, I literally just got up. It was something I'd always wanted to do. And I just got up, got a small backpack together, and I walked to Canterbury. And I followed the Pilgrim's Trail. And I walked about 20 miles a day. And I, I managed to do it in four and a half days. And in the, I just went on booking.com and booked myself a room in a pub that evening. And I walked to that pub following the Pilgrim's Trail. And yeah, so I've just done a pilgrimage to Canterbury. And I got to Canterbury and I said, I've just walked here from London at, to Canterbury the Cathedral. And they treated me as a pilgrim and they, they blessed me. And I had a tour of the church with, with one of the deacons there. And um, it was the whole thing was an utterly pleasurable experience. And I had four or five days walking. And when you walk, you think, and I thought about my life and my family and my ambitions and everything else that I'm interested in. And um, yeah, it was, I would say it's a relatively um, purifying experience. Did you, we, did you know anybody else? No. Wow. So you really could have some time for uh, introspection. Yeah, I was going to do it with my girlfriend. And then she had she got some work in at the last minute, and so she couldn't come. Is and she I, the same one just, that we had lunch with? Yes. Okay. I, I was afraid to ask. Like, are you? You never want to really ask. Are you still together? It's always awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she couldn't come, and and I, and and it was only like two days before that she realized she couldn't come, so I just went by myself, and I ran into a few dog walkers along the way, and you know, the odd person, but on the whole, it was, it was solitary and I, I'm quite happy in my own company. I always have been. And in the evening I'd get, I'd go and sit in the pub and have a couple of pints and talk to whoever was in the pub. But you know, a lot of the time I was on my phone, I could, I could phone, I phoned up my kids while I was walking and had some conversations, you, you know, so I had plenty, I wasn't alone or anything, but it was a, a solitary four and a half day journey. Did, did you know in advance where you were staying each night or did you just find someplace? No, I looked on booking.com for hotels that had rooms at roughly 20 miles from where I was. And a lot of the time there was only one or two places, so there was no decision to have to make. I just took what was available. Okay. Well, that does. I, I'm sitting here thinking about this and imagining it because I think, well, I could probably stand to have fresh air and time to think like that because I am because I the thing is I travel a lot hence the time I saw you not too long ago uh I almost sometimes it's every other week I'm somewhere sometimes with the kids whatever but but I just love to travel and uh and and when I'm because sometimes I'm giving a speech or sometimes it's just you know we all get in a plane and go somewhere or whatever um and so what it means is that the the week or the time that I'm home I work really hard so that mm -hmm. I can enjoy when I'm away. And then when I'm away, like we're all doing things together. 
So I never really have the, that kind of solitude that I think we could all benefit from from time to time. Yeah, and I think, you know, we probably travel too much by car, by train, by plane, and not enough on foot. And we're looking around here, and often we don't notice what's right in front of us. And I definitely feel that I'm more in touch with England and my own country and my own area from having done the walk. You know, and you just notice little details, little streets, little things. And it's, it's you know, how we're designed to see the world. We're, designed to, we're not designed to see the world on, from a plane. We're designed to see the world on foot. It's how we used to get around. And so, yeah, it was quite a sort of back-to-basics experience. Well, it, it sounds tr tr uh, tremendous. I'd love to hear more about it, or if you can send me a link or anything with information about it. Um, I'd love to know more about it. What is the link, though? For, of course, I'll put all, I'll put whatever Frisbee links uh, you direct me to in the description of the video uh, or on the show notes page. But uh, if there was one link you could send people to for more Dominic Frisbee, what would that be? Well, I suppose the easiest thing is the flyingfrisbee.com. That's my newsletter, my sub stack. But I want people to watch this programmable video, programmable money video. So I think if you just go to YouTube and type in programmable money, um, and hopefully my name will come up and watch the video there. Um, and be entertained for three minutes. Well, I'll put I'll put the link to it directly here on the on this video and and, and uh, on our show notes page, which again, again is tomwoods.com slash twenty four zero six. So it is theflyingfrisbee.com. I just typed it in, and that takes me uh, to your your Substack. So I I strongly recommend it. I think um, you know I I always love to see your successes, and and when you have a big hit or you have a you do a show that's widely attended, but even so, despite all that, I still think you are criminally underrated. Until you are a household name, I will not rest satisfied. So uh, do your part, ladies and gentlemen, by going to theflyingfrisbee.com and check out what Dom has to say. Well, as always, I appreciate your, uh, especially your last minute indulgence of uh, Woods's invitations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for having me, Tom, and thank you so much for that lovely compliment. And I, I return it to you by just saying, you know, what a force for good you are in the world, all the media you put out, and what a supportive and, and, and nice man you are, as, as well as conveying a, a strong and important message. And I always enjoy our conversations, and I'm always available to have more of them whenever you like. Thank you so much, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.